The first talk is a fully automated grid square jigsaw puzzle solver by the left Pomeranz, Michal Kremesh, and Nohat Ben Shahar. presented in the previous CDPR. Okay, so jigsaw puzzles. For most of us here, the word jigsaw puzzles, we tend to think about the standard jigsaw puzzles. But in fact, there are many variations to this problem. For example, there is the edge matching, 3D, brick linear, and so on. But today we will focus on square jigsaw puzzles, which give us a very strong indication regarding appearance, but give us almost none about the shape of each board, of each part. Of course, the applications of jigsaw puzzle solving goes well beyond games, and the most commonly well-known are archaeology, when we wish to reconstruct a fragment a artifact. Of course, there is also the known torn and shredded documents application. There are additional, several surprising applications. For example, image editing. And as you can see here, this work by Choi et al. from 2008. They get an input image. They define regions in which in the red they wish to fix and blue wish to delete. And then using the same parts in the image, reconstruct an edited image. In addition to that, square parts could also be used in speech to scrambling. For example, this work by Zoet Al from 2007, they looked at a radio signal, a scrambled radio signal, often used in military applications, and looked at it as a square jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so these are the applications. As an anecdote, let me mention that recent growing interest in the community also led to this DARPA Shredder Challenge. This is a challenge of $50,000 that issued by DARPA to reconstruct five puzzles. Uh, the winning team won just early this month, the $50,000, and to do so, they had to use both automatic and manual labor. So although the history of jigsaw solver uh, computation is rather uh, new, there are several algorithms already that have tackled this problem. For example, there's a genetic algorithm that solved up to 64 parts of the puzzle that was published in 2002. There's a greedy algorithm that in 2008 reported solving puzzles up to 320 parts. And just recently, last year, a graphical model with addition of clues was able to solve huge or large puzzles of up to 432 parts. And that work, their solver, which now is considered the state of the art, received some media attention and uh, these, as you can see here, for example, a computer solves a 400-piece jigsaw to claim world record and so on. And this showed that there is a growing interest in the community for these <coughs> solvers and applications. But it's still important to understand what the state of the art meant until now. So this is their output on a 432 parts puzzle. And as you can see, this is still uh, <coughs> insignificant in inaccuracy. But to re achieve much better results, they use anchor parts, which are clues. For example, you can see here four red dots. These are four parts which were manually initialized prior to invoking <coughs> the algorithm and led to, better, uh, to a better output. So this is their result, and you can additionally see that even these four anchor parts could not guarantee a fully accurate solution. Okay? So this is what we have until now. What we will present to you from this slide and so forth is our solver. Our solver solves this puzzle with significantly better average accuracy. It provides flawless solutions in most cases. This is what I'm speaking about, the 432 parts image database. It uses no clues whatsoever. It's fully automated, meaning that it uses no parameters. 
and it was tested su successfully up to 3,300 parts, which are, of course, an order of a magnitude larger in size. <laughs> okay, so let's fully understand what the square, square jigsaw puzzle problem is. And as you can see here, there are n non-overlapping square parts, which we assume we know their orientation, and we wish to reconstruct the original image. Very well, that is simple. Now let's see an overview of the algorithm. Okay, so our algorithm is an iterative algorithm, and it iterates on three phases. Let's see an example to clearly understand. This is our input image. As you see, it's scrambled, and it's a 432 parts puzzle. First, we'll start with a placement phase. This phase starts with selecting one random part, we'll call this random part a random scene, and place it in the center. Now we have four locations in which we can place each of the n minus one additional parts. So we'll select one part, we'll do it in a greedy manner. In this example, we just place it below that part. So far, so good. We then continue to place the parts in a greedy manner, and then we reach the boundaries. When reaching the boundaries, we initiate a floating mechanism if possible, the puzzle will now float in case we wish to add another part below. So that will happen, and as you can see, the puzzle floats. We continue to do so, but eventually, life is hard and sometimes mistakes occur. But let us not be deterred by that. We continue and finally finish the first phase by getting a candidate solution. Now, as you can see, this candidate solution is much better than the input image, but it still is insufficient. Small observation. We as humans, looking at this puzzle, see many regions which are, we believe are correctly reassembled. Now, if we as humans would have to tackle this problem from this stage, that would be a much easier problem than just solving the first input image when the image was entirely scrambled. Why is that? Because we detect those regions, we clear the rest, and continue from there. Of course, there are many, there are less parts because we have now many segments. And what we'd like to do in this phase, the second phase, is to take a candidate solution and now try and find, with this intuition, the correctly reassembled regions. So we formulate this intuition into an algorithm. And now we get a segmentation map. This segmentation map defines in each color a different segment. And as you can see, there is a very big blue segment here, which the software, the algorithm, detects as a large, uh, correctly assembled region. So this is the second phase. The output is the segmentation map. Now we have something that is much more close to the standard jigsaw puzzle. Why? Because now we have segments of different size and shape. OK. So what the third phase will do, getting that segmentation map, it will need to shift the segments into their correct location. OK? But this is a little bit hard. We'll use a very simple algorithm in the third phase. What we will do is take the largest segment, throw away the rest, and take the, that segment and use it as a seed to the placement phase. OK, and we start and iterate a new iteration. So this is at the beginning of the second iteration. And now we continue our algorithm. So now we get a new candidate solution. You can see that this candidate solution is better. And we decide to continue to yet another iteration. And we will continue once more. And what you will see now is the fourth and fifth iterations the fifth was needed for convergence, and now we receive a fully uh, solution, which is, of course, 100% accurate. This, however, should not be seen as a, uh, a single example. On the 432 <coughs> parts database, this is our result for most of the pictures. OK, so let's dive deeper into the problem. And inside the jigsaw solver problem, there is the parts compatibility problem. And this problem is when given part xi and xj in one of four spatial relations, we would like to find a function. This function 
retrieves value between 0 and 1, which indicates the likelihood that these two parts are actual neighbors in the original image. So we would like to find this function. How should we do it? We can regard part xi as a k by k by 3 matrix. Now let's compare it to another part. Most solvers by now use basic methods, such as the L2 norm, to measure the distance between the boundaries. We say we start by saying that this, op this norm is suboptimal, and we can use another norm, an LP norm, which might achieve better results. And this is its formulation. But this is a rather simple thought. Let's look at a more advanced thought. We can now look at a boundary which is a little bit thicker and try to predict for each part what should be the best boundary next to it. So we take these two boundaries and derive, using Tyler's expansion, what we expect to be the uh, boundary and compare it with the actual boundary of xj. By doing that, using this prediction, and using this prediction, we actually see a, a, more, a distance measure where it is more appropriate for natural images than just measuring the distance between the boundaries. Okay, and after having this distance measure, remember we wanted compatibility function, so we need a robust function that could transform the distance into a compatibility function, and we do it in similar ways to others. So this is a compatibility metric. And in blue here, you see the L2 norm. And in red and green, you see our new uh, uh, compatibility metrics. And what this graph just goes to show that we achieve something like 10% improvement in a new compatibility metric. OK, so having a nice and good compatibility metric, we will define the next uh, concept, which we will use in our uh, in our algorithm for several times. This is the best body concept, and it's used to define a relationship between two parts according to their compatibility <coughs> values. And we'll do so, and I will explain it, using a very uh, simple uh, example from an Euclidean space. Look, for example, at this Euclidean space where we have three points. We can say that B is the closest point to A, but this is not true in the opposite way since the closest point to B is C. Now, if two points are close, closest to each other, then we say that they stand in that relation, and they are best bodies. OK, so this is a very simple definition. We can take it and put it in our domain as follows. Two parts, xi and xj, the relation R1 and opposite relation R2 are said to be best bodies if and only if the following holds. So they have by each other the highest compatibility value. It means both of them agree that they should be placed one by another. So we'll see now how this relation helps us. It is used in our sol solver as follows. First, we employ a best body's greedy criterion between neighbor cells and unplaced parts. Notice that these are two different entities, the neighbor cells and unplaced parts. OK. Second. We use the region growing segmentation algorithm. Now, the part segmentation homogeneous predicate is based on the best bodies concept, which means that two parts are in the same segment if they are best bodies. Notice two things about it. First, we do that and achieve quite well <coughs> segments, meaning that the segments are accurate. The second thing is that we use no thresholding in our algorithm, in the segmentation algorithm. OK, and last, convergence of this iterative algorithm is measured with the best bodies estimation metric. What is an estimation metric? An estimation metric gets a candidate solution and tells us how likely is the quality, how high is the quality of that solution. What is the likelihood that this is a high quality solution? And how do we do it? We do it by counting the number of best bodies in that candidate solution. When this number converges, then the entire iterative process converges. Let's see some results, statistical results. So we'll see our results in three different databases. First, by Cho et al, that we've talked about. And now new two databases, which we created, but taken from two different sources. 
Okay, so these are the databases. Now you can see in black our results, and in red the results of the state of the art without the use, without using any clues. What's interesting about this is even when tackling big puzzles of 805 parts, we still have same results. Now we'll see some runtime uh, data of our solver. And you can see here, for example, that for a 432 parts puzzle, it takes us about 1.2 minutes and roughly six iterations. And again, I just remind that we use no clues and no parameters. Okay, now let's see an, an example of 3,300 parts puzzle. We start with a random seed and use the greedy criterion and continue from there towards a candidate solution. Now we take the largest segment, throw the rest away, put it somewhere, the floating mechanism will float it into a better location and then iteration number three, as you can see, the largest segments segment tend to grow. And we continue. Now the fifth iteration does some mistakes, as you can see in the side. In the sixth iteration, we get the final solution. In the seventh iteration, is required for conversions. So again, this is a huge puzzle that was 100% accurately solved. So. Let us almost conclude. First, we say that the visual puzzle solving might be a lot simpler to automate than previously thought. That is one important thing that we hope to say. The second is, in general, humans are considered superior to computers at solving vision problems. However, computers may now be better at solving visual puzzles. Very well. And I will conclude with the fact that you can find our code, demos, paper, image database, everything you can find in our project site if you're interested. Uh, other than that, I would like to thank you very much. Have a nice day. Okay, the question was, if I have any intuition to which P and U value, which I didn't speak about, should we choose in the compatibility function? Well, I believe that the L2 norm is suboptimal because there could be differences. For example, if there's a boundary between two parts, then there would be a big difference at some, some of the points. So if you use the L2 norm, you might punish that small difference very largely. So if you use other norms, you might, for small discontinuity points, you might punish them less. Okay, so these might be, might be one explanation to why not use a regular L2 norm. Are there any more? Yes? You spoke about the number of parts in the measure of complexity. Yes. Okay, the question was if I have any more measurements regarding the complexity of a puzzle, if it's only the number of parts, well, the, the answer is that the number of parts actually is not the strongest uh, uh, argument. The uh, most stronger or uh, influential parameter is the size of the part. The 322 puzzle, the greedy algorithm that solves the 322 parts puzzle, they solved it using a, a K by K, meaning 150 by 150, that's a huge part. We solve puzzles of 28 by 28, which are very small. So the s part size is an extremely important uh, a parameter. There are others. There are others. Each image is uh, difficult more or less than others, that, that is true, but regarding, you know, fixed 
parameters, I think that what should be studied, for example, more is the effect of smaller and smaller parts. Okay? But yes, what you say is correct. Are there any more? Yes. Is it obvious that every puzzle piece has best body? No. Some pieces don't have best body. As you see in point A in that example, it thinks that B is the closest, but could be that each each and every other point doesn't think that they're closest enough, that A is closest enough to them. So a best body relation doesn't hold for each of the points, and if it holds for a point, it holds once with another best body, and that's all. Yes? Okay, the question was if there are any ways that I can correct a large segment and if, if by any chance I made some mistake. So first we do the segmentation process at each time from beginning. So let's say we start with a large segment and that segment is not good enough. So another segment could grow and we'll prefer that in the next iteration. But if the segmentation algorithm has mistakes by thinking the two parts should be together and actually they're not, then these are mistakes that you know are defined by the compatibility metric. If it is not a good compatibility metric, if it gives us like 86%, which is a rather well, but there are still 40% error mistakes. Okay? But there are ways that you can improve that compatibility metric. I can talk about that maybe not now. Yes. Can you say something about the branching factor of these puzzles? The what? The branching factor, the number of possible uh, pieces that you could uh, to, uh, potentially put next to each other. Well, so this might relate to your question, which uh, tells you something about the complexity of the puzzle. OK, the complexity of the puzzle, as you've asked me to elaborate, uh, when having square parts, then having n square, meaning you have a factorial of n, possible arrangements of these pieces, okay? It, it, we have unique places in which we put them. Since the boundaries are not that curved, I have uh, a known number which is explicitly derived by n in the number of possible arrangements, and it's, of course, more than exponential. Okay, so the complexity should be like the traveling sales problem. Does, does that answer your question? Not exactly. So we, uh, you wouldn't yeah. place uh, all the pieces next to each other, but you would restrict that by your compatibility metric. So what is the, uh, the actual branching factor that your compatibility metric induces on the puzzle? I'm not sure if it does induce anything, but you know what? I, I'll have to take it with you outside. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I hope I didn't intimidate anybody by that. Thank you.